Hello and good day, everyone, uh, to today's um, global COVID-19 press conference together with updates on Ukraine. It is Tuesday, 2 March 2022. My name is Christian Lindmeier. Uh, due to the two events we'll be discussing today, we have a number of guests, uh, but we also have simultaneous interpretation available in the six official languages, um, plus we have Portuguese, I believe. Um, you'll find this in the interpretation box in the, on the bottom of your screen. Let me introduce the participants. First and foremost, of course, we have Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General. We have Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program. And then there's Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, Technical Lead on COVID-19. We have Dr. Bruce Award, Senior Advisor to the Director General and the Lead on the ACT Accelerator. We have Dr. Kate O'Brien, uh, Director for Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals. And online, we're joined for Dr. by uh, Dr. Maria Angela Simao, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products. Uh, especially for the situation in Ukraine, we're joined by colleagues from uh, the European region, and there's uh, Dr. Heather Papowitz, the incident manager for our European regional office. There is also uh, Dr. Jano Habicht, who is the head of office for our office in Ukraine. And here in the room, we have uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, Sosefall. Um, Sorry for that, and we have Dr. Adelaide Marshang, the Senior Emergency Officer for the Health Emergencies Program. Um, with this, let me now hand over to the Director General for the opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. WHO is deeply concerned about the unfolding humanitarian emergency in Ukraine. WHO is on the ground, working with our partners to respond to assess the impact of the conflict on the health of Ukraine's people and its health system, and to deliver essential medical supplies from our hub in Dubai. The first shipment will arrive in Poland tomorrow, including 36 metric tons of supplies for trauma care and emergency surgery to meet the needs of 1,000 patients and other health supplies to meet the needs of 150,000 people. Prior to the conflict, WHO distributed emergency supplies to 23 hospitals, although our prepositioned supplies in Kyiv are currently inaccessible. There is an urgent need to establish a corridor to ensure humanitarian workers and supplies have safe and continuous access to reach people in need. To support our response, WHO has so far released 5.2 million US dollars from our contingency fund for emergencies. Our needs for the next three months are $45 million for Ukraine and $12.5 million to support neighboring countries to care for refugees. Anyone can contribute to support our response through the WHO Foundation appeal page by going to www.who foundation and clicking on donate. We are also deeply concerned about reports of attacks on health facilities and health workers. We have received several unconfirmed reports of attacks on hospitals and health infrastructure and one confirmed incident last week in which a hospital came under heavy weapons attack, killing four people and injuring 10, including six health workers. We are currently in the process of verifying several other incidents. The sanctity and neutrality of health care, including of health workers, patients, supplies, transport and facilities, and the right to safe access to care must be respected and protected. Tax on health care are in violation of international humanitarian law. Prior to the conflict, 
Ukraine had experienced a recent surge of cases of COVID-19. Low rates of testing since the start of the conflict mean there is likely to be significant undetected transmission. Coupled with low vaccination coverage, this increases the risk of large numbers of people developing severe disease. Critical shortages of oxygen will have an impact on the ability to treat patients with COVID-19 and many other conditions. At least three major oxygen plants in Ukraine have now closed, and we're seeking ways of accessing oxygen from neighboring countries and ways to deliver it safely to where it's needed. Mass population movements are likely to contribute further to transmission of COVID-19, potentially increasing pressure on health systems in neighboring countries. As of yesterday, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees reported that more than 870,000 refugees have left Ukraine, and we expect that number to increase rapidly. WHO is supporting neighboring countries to address key health issues among refugees and forcibly displaced persons, including mental health and psychological assistance, as well as treatment for diseases including HIV, TB, and cancer. WHO remains committed to meeting the health needs of the people of Ukraine. Now to COVID-19. It's encouraging to see that deaths from COVID-19 are now declining globally and in most regions. And it's pleasing to see some countries being able to relax restrictions without their health systems being overwhelmed. But it's far too early to declare victory over COVID-19. There are still many countries with high rates of hospitalization and death and low rates of vaccine coverage. And with high transmission, the threat of a new and more dangerous variant remains very real. We continue to urge all people in all countries to exercise caution and we urge to the only sustainable way out of the pandemic is to reach high vaccine coverage in all countries. Globally, 56% of the world's population has been fully vaccinated, but only 9% of the population of low-income countries. We're now overcoming many of the supply and delivery constraints we faced last year, with more than 1.3 billion doses of vaccine delivered by COVAX, and the supply outlook for this year is positive. We must now turn our attention to addressing the crucial question of how we turn vaccines into vaccinations, how we ensure all countries have enough tests, enough oxygen to treat patients, and enough PPE to keep health workers safe. And we call on all governments to continue with surveillance to track the virus, as well as testing to make sure patients receive the right treatment. To achieve all our targets, we're calling on all countries to fill the urgent financing gap of $16 billion for the ACT Accelerator. Germany has become the first country to pledge to meet its fair share with a generous contribution of 1.22 billion US dollars. Vielen Dank, Germany. And we look forward to other countries following your lead. We must also remember that the effects of the pandemic go far beyond the death and disease caused by the virus itself. In particular, COVID-19 has taken a heavy toll on mental health. A new WHO report estimates that in the first year of the pandemic, the global prevalence of anxiety and depression increased by more than 25%. The greatest increases in depression and anxiety were found in places that were the most affected by COVID-19, where infections were high 
and social interaction was restricted. Our review found that females were more affected than males and younger people, especially those aged between 20 and 24, were more affected than older adults. This increase in the prevalence of mental health problems coincided with severe disruptions to mental health services and underscored chronic underinvestment in mental health, leaving huge gaps in care for those who need it most. By the end of last year, some services had been restored, but too many people remain unable to get the care and support they need. WHO has worked with partners to lead an interagency response to the mental health impacts of COVID-19 by disseminating guidance, tools and resources for responders and the general public and by supporting countries to integrate mental health and psychosocial support in their response. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Now we come to the uh, question and answer session. And please raise your hand with the raise your hand icon in order to get into the queue. And I believe I still owe you the title of Dr. Sosifol, who we have with us. Uh, he's Assistant Director General for Emergencies Response here at WHO at the Emergencies Program. So apologies for this. And we start right away with the first question. And that goes to Michael Buchikiv from CNN Opinion. Michael, please unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Very well. Please go ahead. Okay, so I'm talking to you from the city of Lviv in Western Ukraine. Um, Director General, um, I ask uh, this question of you with the utmost respect. Um, as you may recall, I used to work for UNICEF. I was a spokesperson uh, globally for a while and also in places like OBT. Um, I've been hearing from uh, staff in um, various UN, uh, agency offices here in Ukraine and elsewhere uh, asking me or bringing to my attention that in no statements, including the one you mentioned today, which of course is very useful and the world needs to hear, that the name of the aggressor, Russia, is nowhere to be found. I've also found this uh, in statements with uh, UNICEF Executive Director, uh, also UNHCR, and um, I realized that um, in times like this, it's very difficult to call out a member state. But um, as we all know and verified by, you know, international news organizations and others that children's hospitals have been targeted, schools have been targeted, places which should be safe haven for children have been targeted. When I was um, spokesperson for UNICEF, whether it was the Myanmar generals or warring sides in the Middle East, we would call them out. So my question is this, and sorry for rambling on a bit, but have we reached a point where, where these types of unforgivable actions are happening before our very eyes? And again, verified by credible parties that we are not able to call out a member state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I believe we start with Dr. Mike Ryan. <clears throat> um, uh, thanks for, for your commentary. Uh, we work all uh, around the world, every night and every day, in the service of people affected by conflict and the conflict that is generated by, by so many aggressors around the world, be it as, uh, in international or national conflicts. Uh, there's no doubt in, in this case that the, the, the military operations, invasion, whatever you want to call it, in Ukraine is causing untold suffering to the people of Ukraine. Uh, WHO does not want to be drawn into the politics of that process, but there is no question, and the DG has always made it clear, that he has always been on the side of peace. He speaks about health for peace and peace for health. He speaks that there can be no health without peace. He has always done that. Uh, what we uh, try to do is, is honour the organisation's commitment to standing on behalf, on, beside those who are suffering um, uh, and leave the politics of punishing perpetrators to others who are better capable of doing that. But that is not to say that we don't uh, uh, condemn uh, aggression 
on civilians at every point, and we've seen this, and we've called out on uh, attacks on healthcare, not only here but in Syria and other places, and we have taken a very strong position uh, on attacks on civilians and attacks on healthcare. We, we, we are not politicians, uh, we are a healthcare organisation. Um, but the Director General has been clear each and every time we have come across a situation like this to speak for the need for humanitarian access, for people to stop fighting, for peace to be put in place so health can be preserved. So I, I don't think WHO is in any way unclear in our position on this. Um, and uh, from, from our perspective, we call on the, uh, the parties and, and particularly uh, call on the uh, Government of Russia to reconsider its position in the light of the suffering that's being generated in, uh, in Ukraine. Thank you, very much, Dr. Ryan. And next question goes to Sophie Mokena from South African Broadcasting Corporation. Sophie, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question is directed to Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros. As the head of the Global Organization on Health, uh, your concerns around the conflict uh, in Ukraine, have you been able to speak to the authorities uh, from both uh, 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 countries, particularly at the heads of state level, uh, raising your concern around allowing humanitarian assistance or that corridor uh, and also the emergency supply, uh, so that uh, the vulnerable can be assisted, who are in this case women and children, but also people from the diaspora from different countries, in the diaspora from different countries, who are now uh, struggling, uh, particularly in the border. Have you been able to speak to President Putin and President Zelensky to say we need a passage or a corridor so that we can continue with health at the time where the world is struggling with the pandemic. I don't know whether history is repeating itself. 2018, Spanish flu, it was just immediately after the World War. Thank you very much, Sophie, and uh, Dr. Tedros. Yeah, thank you, Sophie. Uh, for that question. Um, we haven't spoken to them yet, but it's very important to do that. Um, our first shipment is arriving tomorrow. Uh, of course, we have indicated today in my statement, I have indicated that uh, we will need a corridor to support uh, the needy. Uh, so uh, since we are now sending the supplies from uh, Dubai and other hubs that, that, that we have, uh, we will engage, engage authorities in order to uh, get uh, access. Um, we had a meeting yesterday of uh, UN agencies, and one of the challenges we have identified is uh, access uh, problems, and this has to be addressed, and the right authorities should be contacted in order uh, to give uh, access. Although tomorrow's um, uh, flight will be the first one, but we will have uh, more, and there will be a need uh, for access to those who need uh, our support. Thank you. And Dr. Randis. Can I just supplement? I think the question you, you've asked about humanitarian corridors is very important, and I know the uh, UN ACHA, under the leadership of Martin Griffiths and Red Cross and others, are, are, are really engaged with that. Uh, uh, priority now, which is to assure humanitarian corridors for access for aid. We've got a, a warehouse full of supplies in, in, um, in uh, Kiev, and we need to get those out. We've got oxygen supplies ready to come in from outside. We've got, the, as DG said, the, the planes landing in Poland with very specialized medical supplies. We're talking surgical equipment, debridement equipment, resuscitation equipment, major trauma equipment. We have pre-positioned those supplies, as the DG said, in a number of hospitals before this. And again, to, to maybe to remind people listening in, WHO is not going into Ukraine. We have always been in Ukraine. 
We have been in Ukraine for years working with the government on the health system, on the health system development, on the crisis since 2014 in Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, we have engaged in mass casualty management and major surgical training in hospitals all over Ukraine over the last number of months. Adelaide and others may wish to speak to that, or, or Heather, who's online. We have been preparing and working with the Ukrainian health authorities. We have a very deep, and the DG has a very deep and strong relationship with ministries of health all over the world, not least of which with the Ministry of Health in Ukraine. Uh, our primary purpose now is to sustain and preserve the health system in Ukraine, that it may serve the people of Ukraine, and we will do everything in our power to make that happen. But as you said, we cannot do that if we cannot get there and surge and support our staff, if we cannot bring supplies in, if we cannot bring oxygen in, if we cannot distribute the supplies we already have in the country, then we are blocked. So humanitarian access, uh, corridors, moments of peace, uh, anything that can be done to create a situation where we can move supplies, move patients, move other things will be hugely uh, beneficial at this point. But right now in the chaos of what's happening there, it's very hard to see how that can be achieved in the coming days. And that's why the tragedy unfolding for the people of Ukraine is, is so avoidable and so unnecessary. Thank you very much for this. And I'm looking into the virtual room if Dr. Heather Popovich, Incident Manager Euro, as indicated, wants to maybe add. Thank you. Uh, put really well. Um, and just to add that uh, we are there in Ukraine. And even though there's uh, access issues, we're still working directly with the government um, through cell phones, um, any way we can. We're coordinating partners. The health cluster is very active. Um, we're conducting risk assessments and um, really doing what we can, even if we're not able to move around. So we're still um, trying to support as much as we can access to uh, emergency health care. And I don't know if uh, Yarno wants to add a little bit more. Yes, please, Dr. Uh, Jarno Habicht, Head of Office for Ukraine, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you to Dr. Tedros, uh, Mike, Heather, um, uh, summary. And uh, yes, we have been working with Ukraine, and we are working now, and we continue to work. And uh, for the uh, arrivals uh, tomorrow that Dr. Tedros also mentioned, we have agreement uh, to use logistic as much as possible what is available from authorities. Uh, to ensure that we are getting all those goods to the hospitals uh, closest where the needs are. But uh, the corridors and protecting the healthcare workers is the most important. Um, in the past days, my main discussions with the Minister of Health is how do we ensure that healthcare workers are protected? So it is about humanitarian law. It is about protecting the healthcare workers who have went through last two years on treating COVID, ensuring that there is access to care. And now this will put them under huge stress. Many of them with whom I talked yesterday are working from the shelters, have repurposed their hospitals. We have a number of cities, especially in East where hospitals and the cities are isolated. And in those places, necessary oxygen in the coming weeks. So uh, it's avoidable and very important that uh, the access is ensured as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. And we move to Denise Rowland from the Wall Street Journal. Denise, please unmute yourself. Oh, hello. Hi. Thanks very much for taking my question. Um, so it's it's on um, Ukraine as well. Um, I've seen the WHO highlight a problem with oxygen supplies, that this is running out in some places. Are there any other specific medical supplies or drugs that are in shortage or, or already run out? Um, and I've also heard uh, concerns from WHO about the, the polio vaccination campaign that was underway in Ukraine prior to the fighting. And I was curious about what steps you're taking on the ground there to, to reinstate that? What, what's actually possible at the moment? Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Raj Denise, and uh, we'll go to Dr. Habich, the head of office in Ukraine, for specifying here. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and the three things to mention here, 
Uh, one is on oxygen. Oxygen is particularly needed in some of them uh, hospitals uh, which are getting isolated. So there the treatment, we need uh, oxygen for the treatment. And for that one, again, the same safe passage because um, um, under the current situation, it's difficult even to find drivers who are willing to drive and to bring the oxygen from some of the factories which still have reserves. But as was said before, three of the factories are now closed as well. So there are reserves still, which is a positive news, but we need to ensure that that oxygen reaches to, their, to the hospitals where the patients are. When we talk about specific medicines, it really varies from hospital to hospital. Those hospitals which are isolated will um, have need for different type of um, uh, medicines, but also more and more the trauma kits, because um, this is what we see from violence and uh, the needs are different. There is no time to treat about um, chronic diseases, but the key is to ensure life-saving treatment. So it is situ the situation varies from east to west, and where um, the, the military offensive takes place. And the third on the IPV campaign that was taking off uh, from the 1st of February to um, uh, do the catch-up campaigns, it started from the Western Oblasts. So the public health authorities are trying to do their best in Rivne, in Sarkapatia, in other Oblasts to still continue, but it is becoming very, very difficult. Thank you. Thank you for very much for this very good picture here. And we go to Dr. Adelaide Marshall here, the Senior Emergency Officer at uh, WHO. Uh, thank you, Christian. And in complement to what Jarno has already said, just to highlight that we are reviewing the situation and the health risks on a daily basis. And indeed, we have looked into specifically what medicine shortages we may be facing. And we do have indications that we may have or face imminent shortages of cancer medicines, that insulin, uh, as, as Jarno had highlighted, non-communicable non chronic diseases are an issue, that the lack of insulin and not having access to diabetes supplies can result really in grave situations for the people with some type of diabetes. We are looking into that and, and tracking the, um, and, and tracking and trying to set up a tracking system that, that will inform us of the specific uh, needs and medicine shortages. We also see that as the lines of controls are changing and health facilities are uh, uh, changing in, uh, in, in their way of working, possibly, that we will face also issues with getting supplies to them in the near future. Over. Thank you very much for this. Next question goes to Mose Appelblatt. He's from the Brussels Times. Mose, please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like also to come back uh, about Ukraine. You mentioned, I mean, the surge in uh, infections uh, before, before the invasion of the start of the war. And we know, as it has been said before uh, previously, that uh, the vaccination rates in both Russia and Ukraine are very low. And as you said, also that now during the war, I mean, there's almost no testing going on. So I wonder, is it possible, or have you already done it to, let's say, estimate or predict how the war, if it continues without an assist how soon, how will that, let's say, influence the COVID-19 situation in Ukraine uh, when it comes to infection rates uh, and the number of people uh, which are severely ill and will need, let's say, treatment at the hospitals, which I suppose now are overwhelmed by people with war injuries who have even been bombed. And also you mentioned that people are fleeing on the roads and so on. So lots of mass gathering and so on. Uh, how will all that affect, I mean, the situation in Ukraine? Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Mose. So you're asking about the vaccination rates on COVID and the situation for COVID and the outlook there in the country. So we, let's go to Dr. Jano Habicht again. Uh, the head of office, and then we'll, we'll elaborate further. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, when we look to the COVID trend and the wave that started in Ukraine in the beginning of February, 
it reached the peak in the middle uh, of February, uh, started in the beginning and reached to the middle of um, uh, peak uh, in the middle of February to the peak. Uh, and we saw that actually from all the COVID hospital beds, only 35% were occupied. So let's put it in this way. This time uh, it was milder than all the previous waves that we saw in the autumn and spring 2021. At the same time, um, the oxygen is an issue because we still have a lot of um, uh, vulnerable and more elderly people in the hospitals who need oxygen support. So in those territories where um, the military offensive takes place and where hospitals are getting isolated and where we don't have uh, access, but also it's not only about oxygen, it's also about electricity, it is also about the medicines. There it is difficult. We don't have exact numbers, but uh, also, as was said by Adelheid and others, we are tracking the system uh, situation in the best possible way. On vaccination coverage, um, it varied. When we look to Kiev city, then Ukraine reached to 65% of both doses vaccination. But wh where is the vulnerability is Donetsk and Luhansk where the vaccination coverage was reaching only to the 20%. So we see huge variation. And before, if I think back two weeks, what we discussed, we were preparing how to really go from village to village. We just selected 200 villages to reach those who are vulnerable, 65 plus population. So we are concerned, especially for those who are 65 plus and to ensure that they have vaccination coverage. But, um, in the current circumstances, we need to assess, we need to ensure that there is a safe path to of the healthcare workers, to those households, those people, and these are the negotiations that need to take place at a very high level. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Sosifal, Assistant Director General, Emergencies Response, please. Thank you, Christian. To complement uh, our representative, the impact of the conflict on COVID-19 is already very big because we have seen a huge decrease in terms of you know, capacity to test. Last week only we have seen more than 80% reduction in the number of PCR tests performed in the country. And uh, the other issue is the disruption of health services in terms of clinical management for COVID. We already talked about the oxygen supply, but the risk is to see very high case fatality rate as we have seen in other conflict affected countries like Yemen where we have more than 18% case fatality rate. So making sure that we have the continuity of services because the health workers also will leave the hospital when it's not safe. So it's very complex and we are at risk of seeing people dying from condition we can really treat and this is really, really bad. Thank you. And Dr. Ram, please. So, and and uh, just to add, when we talk about you know, I think I think the estimate uh, uh, just uh, last week was there was about 2,000 people on oxygen, high flow oxygen for COVID in 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 Ukraine. There's 2,000 people that need oxygen to survive, uh, and that number, you know, it hasn't changed. And in fact, if anything, that number has gone up because we have people with injuries, people undergoing surgery who need oxygen. We have children with childhood pneumonia. We have women in difficulties in labour. So oxygen is not just life-saving in COVID. Oxygen is life-saving, full stop. Um, and you need it when you need it. You can't wait till tomorrow for oxygen. You can't wait till next week. You can't be put on a waiting list for oxygen. You can't stand in a queue for oxygen. Oxygen saves your life right now. Uh, and when you need it, you need it. Uh, and Ukraine needs that. That's just one example, as Sose has said, but it's a very clear example that if we do not get oxygen into the system and other critical drugs, people will die needlessly. In, in the, well, they're dying needlessly to start with, but there's a secondary level of needlessness. And uh, when you see the images, and we've all seen them here ourselves, and you know, some of us have been in this game a long time, and we've developed very thick skins, but when you see nurses mechanically ventilating infants in basements of hospitals. Um, you know, even the, the toughest of us, we struggle to watch that. Uh, and those heroes um, who are there, those uh, mainly women, might I add, in those basements who are uh, taking care of those kids. 
But if you're a, a, a 65 or 70 year old in an ICU, no one can carry you down the stairs to the basement. So many patients in adult ICUs cannot be moved. And they're being cared for by doctors and nurses while the bombs fall around them. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's really important that we don't just break this down into supplies and break this down into commodities that we have to deliver and uh, corridors and we speak in these very abstract terms around what's needed. You know, the, this is the, in people's uh, bodies and people's bones are being broken, people's lives are being lost and there isn't a health service available to be able to deliver life-saving care and we can't supply that health service at the moment. So something has got to move and something's got to change to create the conditions in which that can happen. Um, and uh, we need to be able to, as uh, we've seen with insulin, again, you can't wait for your insulin. Uh, in fact, those planes that are arriving today and tomorrow have pretty uh, good supplies of insulin on them. So um, uh, that's one product that we definitely need to get into the country. So um, I do think <clears throat> we need to step back and also admire and, and really I just could not believe uh, the bravery uh, of those frontline health workers and uh, they're a shining example to the world of what the health system should be doing everywhere. Thank you so much for this. Um, we move on to Pretty Patnaik from the Geneva Health Files. Pretty, please unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, we, we know that the pandemic is far from over uh, but is the WHO under pressure uh, to consider declaring the end of the pandemic sometime in 2022, uh, particularly because uh, COVID-19 vaccines production uh, will reach a surplus soon, um, and this will inevitably have an impact on the discussions at the WTO around the TRIPS waiver? Um, it will be good to know uh, the circumstances under which uh, you know, the organization will declare an end to the pandemic. Uh, that will also have an impact on the uh, contracts of pharmaceutical companies on pricing and patents and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priti. And we move to Dr. Maria van Kerkhove, COVID lead. Yes, thanks. So I'll start and, and others I'm sure will come in. So I, I think we would like nothing more to say that this pandemic is over, but unfortunately we're not there yet. Um, with the fact that we, we are still seeing incredibly intense transmission of Omicron worldwide, um, this variant has quickly replaced Delta in circulation and detection around the world. Many countries have passed their peak um, of transmission of Omicron, but many have not. Um, and we have seen in a number of countries um, the amount of death um, that has been reported from Omicron um, has in fact been higher than it was in the Delta wave, in their Delta wave that they experienced. And this is because of the sheer volume of cases uh, that we've seen from Omicron. And even though intrinsically it's less severe than Delta, the number of people that have required hospitalization and have died from Omicron um, has been higher in a number of countries. And this is due to a number of factors. One is because of the, the sheer volume and the, the burdening of the health healthcare systems around the world that are fragile from past waves of, of, of infection. Um, second is because we have not reached the vaccination coverage levels that we've needed in all countries, and in particular, reaching those who are most vulnerable. In the countries that have seen higher amounts of death in the Omicron wave compared to Delta, um, we've actually seen that this is in fact in populations who are not vaccinated, who have not received the full course, people who are of older age, people with underlying conditions. And this, we've used this word avoidable a lot today. This is also avoidable. So reaching the vaccination coverage, the 70% that the Director General um, has outlined of reaching 70% of all populations in all countries it's who within that 70% that is really critical. The SAGE recommendations have been very clear on who we need to target in all countries. These are people of older age. These are people of underlying conditions. These are our frontline workers. And in fact, we have not reached all of those individuals in all countries. So that is our target. That is who we are aiming to reach in all countries. And no matter what is happening out there in the rest of the world, we still need to push vaccination coverage as best we can, while at the same time doing everything that we can recognizing the challenges that all countries are facing right now and the fact that they're in different situations to also drive transmission down with the tools that we have. So it's both sides of that equation. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Dr. Brozelva, please. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Christian. There are two parts to that uh, question, of course. And I think the first one about the end of the pandemic, like uh, Maria highlighted, this is not a function of vaccination coverage. It's what's happening with the epidemiology and the virology that drives this. And remember that the surge we are seeing now of Omicron is just the most recent surge of this virus. So it is going to be a function of time and the control measures that are going to tell us when we are approaching the end of the pandemic. Important point, as Maria says, is we have the knowledge, we have the tools to get there, only if we apply them everywhere. Vaccination rates become really important because the higher we can get the vaccination, the faster we're going to get there and drive this. But there was a second part of the question, and that was about the vaccine supply being secured. And I think we need to be clear here. We're in a situation right now where, yes, we do have um, a lot of vaccine, increasingly a lot of vaccine that is available. That vaccine is not in the arms of the people that need it everywhere, as, uh, as um, uh, Maria highlighted. And one of the appeals the director general led 10 days ago was for the additional financing that's needed to make sure that the vaccines turn into vaccinations, that the tests turn into actual testing results, that the uh, oxygen, et cetera, actually gets to the people that need it. And that requires another $16 billion. So there is also a price tag to getting us faster to the end of uh, the pandemic. And the last point was just in terms of that supply, well, we have supply. We still have that problem we started the pandemic with, and that is that the control of that supply is really in very few hands. And the only way that we're going to be able to ensure security globally in the future is exactly as you highlighted, and that is the um, more geographically and fairly distributed means of production as well. And we are not there yet. Important work's been done. You saw over the last few weeks some very important announcements about the uh, new WHO mRNA hub uh, with, uh, in, in, in South Africa. There are many spokes now off of that hub, a huge effort um, to move very, it's a, it's a bit of a Manhattan project in some regards in moonshot to try and get additional uh, capacity built out around the world as rapidly as possible to be able to manage that aspect as well. Thank you, and Dr. Kaido O'Brien, please. Yeah, I want to amplify some of the things that Maria was uh, referring to. The 70% target is, is the target for achieving the goals uh, related to, to vaccination and, and reducing transmission, but most importantly, reducing disease that is severe and death. And I'll give you an example that it's not 70% of just uh, you know, anybody uh, in the population. It really is about those who are most in need of vaccination to protect them directly uh, from disease. And we're still quite a distance from that. Um, just an example from the Africa region um, with 23 countries where about 35% of the health workers have, have been fully vaccinated. Um, similarly, for those who are older adults, um, about 25% of older adults fully vaccinated and, and similar numbers a little bit lower for those with underlying medical conditions. So the real emphasis um, in every country is about getting 100% coverage of those who are most needing the vaccine, 100% coverage of health workers, 100% coverage of older adults, 100% coverage of those who have underlying medical conditions on the way towards a 70% coverage of the whole population. So this is really where the focus has to be. That's what will take the pressure off the health system because that's what's really underlying the cases that are in hospital and the deaths that are occurring. Thanks. Thank you very much, all. And next question goes to Abdullah Wassan from the Morocco News. Abdullah, please unmute yourself. Abdullah, you hear us? Please unmute yourself. No. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having given me the floor. Thank you very much. I would just have a question. The, in, the interpretation from Arabic has not worked. Okay, Abdella, can I? 
Can I ask you to repeat your question, the key part, and slow, please, because the interpretation has not worked. Let's try again. Thank you very much for having given me the floor. I would like to ask a question on the WHO's availability, availability to supply victims with anything that they might need, and what will the WHO do regarding epi any epidemics that might come about from this crisis? Thank you. Thank you very much, and I assume we're talking about the situation in Ukraine. Dr. Sosifal, please. Merci beaucoup. Je vais y aller en français. Thank you very much. I will reply in French because uh, we had some problems with interpretation, but I think I've understood the message. I think it's important to recall that the WHO has been working with Ukraine already to respond to epidemics such as COVID-19, but also to other epidemics such as uh, polio, vaccine-derived polio. So the infrastructure was already in place to be able to face these emergencies and also to deal with a certain number of refugees in this humanitarian context. We are implementing a system of uh, alert and surveillance for this emergency situation. We are also working with many different hospitals that we have geolocalized uh, to be able to get as much information as possible. We know that this is a very difficult task because there are many Unfortunately, there is noise on the line. The interpreter apologizes. We cannot continue. Donc, nous devons renforcer nos... We must, therefore, bolster our efforts to be able to detect epidemics and prevent epidemics. But as you know, when a vaccine program is interrupted, for example, against uh, measles, then the risk of uh, having an epidemic increases as well. And this is always conditioned by humanitarian access. Without access, there will be a lot of deaths, unfortunately, and people will lose their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sosifal. Next question goes to Jamie Keaton from the Associated Press. Jamie, please unmute yourself. Thank you for taking my question, Christian, and nice to see you all. Um, I, I believe my question must be for Dr. Habich. Um, I would appreciate some more detail about the needs of the supplies that you're providing. You mentioned, um, Dr. Uh, Director General Tedros mentioned um, that there are other supplies to meet the needs of 150,000 people. Could you be specific about that? What exactly supplies are they? Are they specifically geared to the types of trauma that have been sustained by civilians and others there? And does it tell you anything about the types of weaponry that may be used um, in the fighting? Um, in particular. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jamie. And yes, we move to Dr. Jano Habicht from the Ukraine office. Thank you. And uh, the first round, what was mentioned, what was prepositioned, were the trauma and surgical kits. Uh, also, uh, what are coming in are the standard kits that WHO has, which are also aiming for the surgery trauma and uh, all the aspects, what also Mike was describing before. So these are the first deliveries, but we are looking also to uh, very specific aspects like the tetanus, antitoxins, which are very, very important, as well what was mentioned before uh, to address uh, the uh, needs related to non-communicable diseases, be it insulin, what is needed, hypertensive medicines, which are very much needed, but also um, uh, uh, various um, goods and medicines related to sexual and reproductive health, maternal and child health, etc. So these are the standard kits that WHO has put together and to ship them as fast uh, now to Ukraine, but also to other places where they are needed. Uh, and when we look to, um, uh, so these need to get there in the place. And uh, currently, we have not um, collected the statistics, what exactly is happening in every surgery room, because we are really um, supporting the frontline healthcare workers 
to ensure that they are providing the life-saving treatment and support. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, looking at Dr. Popovitz, if she wants to add something. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit on the, um, the refugees coming into surrounding countries. So right now, um, as the Director General said, we have 870,000 people, and that's probably already changed by now, coming into countries at the border and other countries. So the, um, the health interventions um, in, the host, in the countries where people are moving are also important. So as people were in uh, Ukraine, they had less access to healthcare because of COVID, even more um, constrained access to healthcare due to the conflict. So they're coming into the countries already at a more vulnerable. Um, so when they arrive, they also need access to primary health care for all of the things that um, uh, Yarno just mentioned, but also looking at some of the disease control. As they come in, we have to really scale up surveillance in the surrounding countries for polio, for measles, and also for COVID, and uh, make sure that we prevent them. So looking at uh, providing vaccines for measles, um, for polio and for COVID-19 is paramount, but also looking if people are gonna be crowded in uh, certain areas to look at the water sanitation and hygiene um, to prevent diarrheal diseases. So everything that uh, is happening in Ukraine is also affecting the other, um, the other countries. So it's just, uh, it's a real regional crisis. Um, so just wanted to add that. Thank you. And Dr. Ryan, please. Yeah, and, and just on that, the, 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 the supplies that are going in now are again being more specifically designed for the situation as it's unfolded and escalated. So uh, the, the equipment list uh, in terms of what's being, what's landing today, include you know sutures skin graft equipment uh, equipment for doing major surgery unfortunately equipment for doing amputations for bone grafting for bone wiring for all of that and i think this gives you the graphic nature of what's happening these are ordinary civilians being broken um, and the health system is going to have to put them back together again and they need this very specialized equipment for debriding wounds um, and much, much else. Uh, and that's why we have to now obviously shift uh, to from just being general supplies to the health system to supplying the health system what it needs to save patients' lives who have been injured as innocent bystanders uh, in, in, in a horrific conflict. So we will continue to focus on that. We will continue to focus on getting those demands directly out of the system. We have a surveillance system in place. And again, I would like to recognize the extraordinary leadership of Dr. Jano and his team on the ground. Our national and international staff who've been in Ukraine are, are outstanding individuals and they've stood and done tremendous preparatory work that we can now build on um, uh, and continue to be in contact on a minute to minute basis with our, with our staff. Uh, and with the authorities on the ground. So we need further support in that. We need further financial support. We need further logistic support in order to be able to continue to supply uh, the health needs of the Ukrainian system. But increasingly, uh, unfortunately, these health needs are moving more and more towards battle wounds and people being caught up in a horrific conflict and all of the horrific surgical consequences of that for patients um, all over Ukraine. Thank you very much for these um, pictures and explanations. And we move on to Ari Daniel from the NPR, National Public Radio. Ari, please unmute yourself. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this discussion. Um, in Ukraine, it sounds like there's not yet a humanitarian corridor and that you're urgently requesting that. But can you clarify just how much access you do have? You mentioned you need more, but are you not really able to move the supplies in at all? Thank you. I think we start again with uh, Dr. Habicht uh, from, the, from the country office. Thank you. And uh, we can get goods in, and that's a good news. And we have good collaboration with authorities and uh, there is a protocol in place how to ensure that our goods are moving from Poland to um, Ukraine. 
And further, uh, there are water houses to use and um, in cooperation with where the direct military offensive is not taking place, how to move the goods. So there is certain access, but as the situation evolves, that access is decreasing. And the challenge is that where the major needs are for the surgery, trauma care, what Mike described so well, there we don't have access. So we can get kids to the country, but are they getting there where they are mostly needed in the health system? That's the question. And that's from where Dr. Tedros also started, that we had prepositioned some of the goods, but currently those warehouses are not accessible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question that goes to Adriana Rodriguez from USA Today. Adriana, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much for taking my question. It's another one regarding COVID and the situation in Ukraine. I mean, obviously, currently there is insurmountable devastation and suffering happening right now. But is there also a concern of increased COVID transmission followed by severe disease and possibly more death in the upcoming weeks, not only in Ukraine, but in neighboring countries? Um, why or why not? And if we are worried about this possible consequence, what can be done? Thank you. Um, anytime you disrupt a society like this and put literally millions of people on the move, then in infectious diseases will exploit that. People are packed together, they're stressed, uh, and uh, they're, they're not eating, they're not sleeping properly. They're, they're highly susceptible to, to the impacts uh, of, first of all, of being infected themselves, and it's much more likely that disease will spread. So what might be for the rest of the world a inverted commas mild variant could be a very different experience for someone who is in that situation and we see this all the time in refugees we see this all the time around the world uh, we see this in the Middle East we see this in Africa the uh, the consequences of infectious disease in displaced people in refugees who've been um, as I said on the move overcrowded stressed without proper nutrition or sleep infectious diseases exploit exploit that so there's no question that the disease, uh, COVID-19, will, will, will exploit that in, 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 the, coming, in the coming weeks. Um, and there are uh, fixes to that. I will leave Maria and maybe Bruce to, to speak to that. But first and foremost, to ensure that everybody is vaccinated. And as Jarno said, uh, um, Ukraine have been doing quite well in the vaccination uh, area. It still had a significant number of people to cover. Uh, and we need to try and ensure at least that uh, uh, refugees coming out of Ukraine are properly offered proper vaccination. And as I said, not just for COVID-19, but for, and Heather spoke to for other for other diseases. But within um, uh, Ukraine, we also have to continue to make our efforts to support not only prevention, but also in terms of life-saving interventions. Um, and our, our clinical lead, Janet Diaz, is working with Heather and the team to see how we can prioritise getting antivirals. In this particular situation, this may be one situation where the, the available therapeutics may be more life-saving than another situation. So we've been prioritising Ukraine over the last 42, 72 hours for extra supplies of uh, 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 therapeutics for COVID-19, including the newer antivirals. So maybe Maria can speak to that, or, or Bruce. Yeah, so just to supplement what Mike has said, I mean, um, you know, obviously it's a challenging situation. We're seeing the same image as you are, um, and people need to do the best that they can at the moment, recognizing the challenging situation that they're in. This virus will exploit um, the current situation. It has. It's shown us over and over again in the last couple of years that it will take advantage of any crowding. Um, and when there aren't systems in place, when there isn't surveillance, when there isn't distancing, when there isn't the use of masks, it will exploit that. Um, and so, you know, the best people can do is all we can ask right now. We would like for vaccination coverage to continue, vaccines to, to continue, um, recognizing that that may not be possible right now, um, but it needs to be pursued. Where individuals are as best as they can, if they have access to masks, to continue to wear masks where they can, um, if that's even possible, um, to prevent the onward spread amongst themselves, their families, their loved ones who they're coming in contact with. Um, I think we all recognize the challenges, but it doesn't mean we give up and it doesn't get, doesn't mean we stop trying. So no matter where people are and the situations that they're in, we will be there to support. 
and people who are crossing the borders into other countries, they need to be cared for in those other countries. Every single life matters, every single life. Um, and we need to uh, work as hard as we can to not only end the, the conflict, but to end COVID-19. So wherever you are, wherever you're sitting and watching this right now, you also have a role to play because the intensity of spread that we're seeing around the world is far too high. 60,000 reported deaths last week that we know of, down from the week before, but it's still far too high in the third year of this pandemic. So even though you may be far away from the conflict, you have a role to play in this because the virus is spreading. So please play your part, wear a mask, get vaccinated, be educated about how what your own risk is and lower your risk and support the people who are going through this conflict in Ukraine. Dr. Elwood, please. Uh, thank you, Christian. Um, Adriana, to your point, first, as Mike said, you know, infectious diseases uh, ruthlessly exploit ruthlessly the conditions created by war on two fronts. The increase, the transmission of these diseases, as you've heard from Mike, you know, the crowding, the conditions, et cetera. They also increase the probability of increased deaths. More people are vulnerable in these settings, and there's less care available for them. It's as simple as that. What can we do about it? Number one, stop the war. You want to stop the infectious diseases, stop the risks, stop everything else. As Mike said, stop the war. We have to be super clear on that, because everything else is dealing with consequences. Second thing you do, though, in that setting as it unfolds, is you protect your health care system. Health care systems are sanctum and war. They're protected by international law. You've got to protect your services. And the third thing, then, is you try and prioritize your vaccination for your vulnerable, your vaccination for your health care workers. Mike said you're trying to address the oxygen shortages to take care of people who uh, do. So you're not helpless. There are things that can be done, but you need the space to be able to do those. Most importantly, stop the war. Secondly, protect your services. And thirdly, prioritize most vulnerable. Right now, we can't do any of those three, which makes it more challenging. Can try to do a lot. There's a lot of bravery heroism ongoing, as Mike highlighted, but uh, so much more needs to be done. Thank you all so much for these important words. And we're slowly coming to the hour before I give uh, the floor back to Dr. Tedros for his final remarks. I want to give the chance to Dr. Jana Habicht again, the head of country office in Ukraine, to, uh, to close with his remarks. Thank you. So thank you. Um, really three things. First, thank you for hearing about Ukraine. First, um, humanitarian access and humanitarian law. That's what we, and respecting that is what we need to ensure that we can support Ukraine and its health system. Second, really protecting the health facilities and healthcare workers. They are the heroes. They have been always heroes, the nurses, doctors, technical staff who are moving the canisters of oxygen around. It's hard work, but we need to protect them. So that's extremely important that they feel safer, that they can provide the care. And the third, if that situation currently and the military offensive continues, then the situation that we will see when we meet in a week, two weeks, months, or two months time will be much worse than we discussed today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Habicht and Courage out there. Uh, I'm, I'm also looking at Dr. Heather Papovic, the incident manager of Euro for the wider context. Uh, Heather, please, if you want to add something. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just echo what uh, everybody else has said so far. And I just want to say that uh, the support for this response has been outstanding. We've had um, people volunteer from all over the organization, from outside the organization. Um, we've had people offer support. We've had emergency medical teams from everywhere offer support. So it's been um, it's been a real uh, effort across all uh, the whole organization and with our partners and donors. And it's really uh, it's heartwarming to see during this extremely sad and difficult time how everybody is pulling together uh, to really support uh, the people 
Ukraine and to help support the surrounding countries. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for really, really getting out there and trying to help. Thank you so much, Dr. Popovich, as well. Um, yeah, I want to thank everybody for a great discussion today and all the journalists. Um, and of course, we will we will have the uh, Dr. Tedros remarks right after the press conference and the full transcript of the briefing will be posted on the WHO website tomorrow tomorrow morning. Any questions, please either send to us at media inquiries or to the Euro, Euro press office. Um, I want to thank all panelists for an extremely interesting uh, briefing today and very uh, doing very challenging times. And Dr. Tedros, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Uh, tomorrow, March 3, is uh, World Hearing Day, and so many of us take it for granted, but hearing is a precious and fragile gift. WHO estimates that more than 1 billion people aged 12 to 35 years risk losing their hearing due to prolonged and excessive exposure to loud music, video games, movie theaters, and, and, and more. This can have devastating consequences for their physical and mental health, education, and employment prospects. For World Hearing Day, WHO has issued a new international standard for safe listening at venues and events. Uh, this new global standard includes six recommendations, including a maximum average sound level of 100 decibels to ensure venues and events limit the risk of hearing loss to their patrons. Uh, we urge all governments, venues, and event organizers to adapt and implement these new standards. Thank you for joining us, and see you next time.